Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Ports Tourism and Business Network, our second workshop of a series. And this morning, this is all about telling your story and telling your story in as positive and engaging a manner as possible and developing that story. So I'd like to welcome you all. I'd also like to welcome our two guest speakers this morning, Liz Jones from Shiggins Town Castle in Wexford and John O'Neill from Jeannie Johnston and Dublin Discovered Boat Tours as well. So thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. The focus as always is to support, engage, diversify, grow, build a community, collaborate and encourage sustainability and positive collaboration. The focus as I said this morning is to positively support and empower you to tell your business story, your location story and or your destination story. The why of this, is this is one of the ways now that we can engage more with our audience. Things have changed in the marketplace, as I say, on a regular basis. And our story has become very much part of a reasoning of why people will engage with you online and offline. They want the real peace now. So that is the why. And that why can turn into real business, football and revenue. Any of us that are in business, that is a key focus and it has to be. You're not running charitable organizations, you're running a tourism business or a business that depends on tourism in some aspect for all or part of the revenue they generate. So I wanna start with some story bites before we go into our guest speakers. And I'm gonna go down to seven of them. And um, we're gonna talk about some of the success stories because there are some success stories that we've come across in our own business here at Boston Consultancy. Tourism is one of the key sectors for us. Everyone that works in this office has, has come from a tourism background. Three of us have come from a tourism background. And any subcontractors need to have an understanding of that as well. We also work with other sectors, but the tourism one is, is a big one for us. So we see a lot of success stories. And we see a lot of struggle too. And we see how the story can help people overcome that struggle. The brand element. The story has to be and can be part of your brand. And can you see the presentation? Can everyone see the presentation? No. Not yet. Oh. Okay, one second. That was really delayed. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can see you shared uh, your screen. Brilliant. Apologies. I don't know why that happened. Okay, so we're back to the story bites. The brand element is our identity as a business. And our story is now very much part of that, as is our ethos and culture in business. And we have to be aware of that value and acknowledge that value and recognize that value, because if we don't, we are going to leave money behind us. Polishing the hidden gems. So today I'm going to reference this. There are hidden gems in every business. And sometimes it's easier for someone like myself or others to come in that are external to the business to see these hidden gems quicker than we do in our own business. And look, I'm guilty of that in my own business. I'm a business owner as well. Um, and I'm involved in other businesses as well, personally. And I think that it's when I can see a lot of potential in businesses and it's like light bulb moments. So we're going to look at that as well. Change, challenge and connection, three C's as I call them. We've come through a lot of change in the last two years and we are going to continue to, co to go through different change over the next two years, I believe. We're going into an uncertain marketplace um, it's not time for panic, it's just time to change up what we do and how we do it. It's a challenge. There's always going to be challenges in the tourism sector, there's always going to be challenges in business, and it's how you can work your story around the solution that's going to help you overcome that challenge. And one thing I'm passionate about is connection. It's about connecting with the, not the mass audience, because if you're doing that, you're flying blind. It's about connecting with your ideal visitors, your ideal customers, your ideal guests, who are going to stay, enjoy and experience what you have to offer. And it's connecting with them in a very mindful and thoughtful manner. Your story can help you to do that. Another thing I think is very important and in the Ports Past and Present initiative, it's one thing that I really like about it, is the community element. You are part of a community around you, right? So Beth, in Anglesey, you are part of the community that exists in. The same with Barry in Hollyhead, Liz in Shigginstown, Carmel out in Killinick. You are part of that community and you can actually bring that into your story. Connecting past, present and future. 
So one of the key pieces in the Ports Past and Present Initiative is heritage and culture. And what heritage and culture exists either in your business or around your business that you can bring into your story to help you engage with the ideal type of customers that you want. And the one thing that I'm sure everyone that knows me in business and anyone that's ever worked with me will hear this, and it'll probably be written on my epitaph, is write it out to write it out. I'm a firm believer in that your story needs to be written on paper or typed on paper to see it because the ink on the page won't lie. You have to look at it. OK, regardless of the technology, I think that's something that we have to do. So I'm going to recap on those later on. But for now, that's just a brief of them. Is everyone OK with that? OK, two little quotes I put in here. The one is a bit unusual. The first one's a bit unusual because it comes from a man that is a writer and director of horror films. But um, he's also a writer and director of books, so a writer of books. So I'm obsessed with giving the audience something they don't see coming. And he's talking about the power of storytelling there, okay? And I like that as well. Um, it's given the element of the unexpected um, and a surprise for people when they come to a destination or they come to a business, something they weren't expecting, okay? And this is from Seth Godin. Um, Seth is a marketing guru and a business guru, and he's someone I studied in university, and I ended up meeting him in the States years later, but he's a really, really good guy. Marketing is no longer about the stuff that you make, but it's about the stories that you tell. And I think that is more applicable now post COVID than it's ever been, because people want real, relatable stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Right, some key words here when we're talking about storytelling, and I want you to think about these. As I said, this will be available as a replay, so you don't need to write down things um, if, you don't, if you don't feel like it. It's about emotions. It's about linking places. It's about engaging your audience. It's about grabbing attention. There's a lot of noise online at the minute. And you, your job as a business owner and as an entity is to stand out from that noise. And your stories can help you to do that if they're engaged with in the right way. It's about triggering memories and helping people to create memories. It's about using what I call positive persuasion in your business model. Um, and I always say that, that COVID pushed us and encouraged positive change and persuaded us into positive change. So likewise in a business, you can positively um, persuade somebody to come to your business if you use your story in the right way. Identify with the ideal audience. And I say ideal audience as opposed to your general audience. It's not about the masses here because the masses is not what you're looking for. You're looking for your ideal visitor, your ideal client, your ideal customer, okay? So I just want to reference three experiences that I know really well and I've worked with. So um, one of them is in Wexford. One of them is in Cork and one of them is in Clare. Um, and the reason I'm using these three apologies to the Welsh contingent is these are three that I know very, very well personally and professionally. So these are case studies. So um, I know anyone in Wexford will probably know Secret Valley. So I'm going to just take you there to um, their website for a moment. So Anna Connor. She is a little powerhouse lady and she runs um, Secret Valley in Wexford. Secret Valley is a business that has come through an awful lot of challenges, an awful lot of challenges. And um, Anne was sent to us at a time of crisis in her business. And they were very, very close to closing. And that's about eight years ago now. We've been working with them on and off since. But one of the things, I did two things with Anne when I started working with her. One was, you need to tell your story. And then the other one was, you need to look at your price, right? You need to look at your pricing and your value. So she has, they have developed hugely and they bring the story of the site and the story of the animals. The animals all have their own little personality there. And that's what engages people offline and online, right? 
I don't have time to go into it all now, but I'm going to, I, I would encourage you all to just take a look at her site, look her up online. They're, they're doing a lot of videos now, a lot of really nice stuff. But the one thing that you'll find about their, their marketing is it's very much about the person. It's very much about the, the visitor. Um, and it's very much about their own story on their site. And that's why people enjoy visiting them again and again. Okay, so that's Secret Valley. The second story that I want to look at for a moment, sorry now guys, is the Jameson experience in Cork. Now this is a, a video that is gonna take you, um, gonna take you to their video, if I can just get it for a second. Apologies, here we go. Has anyone here been to the Jameson experience in Cork in Middleton? Okay. Well worth a visit. Um, if you're like me and you like a nice whiskey, it's definitely well worth a visit. But it, it also has a lovely sense of story to it. And if you go into their story, they have a complete section on their history, their craft, the story of how it was, you know, how it evolved, and also the up-to-date story about how they do their green initiative. So they're using those elements. They're all part of their story starting in 1780 when John Jameson established the way of making Irish whiskey that we know today as the Jameson experience. That engages their visitors again and again. And there's a link to videos there that tell their stories as well, okay? And the final one that I want to reference, it's one I have a soft spot for because it's about 15 minutes from where I'm from in Limerick. Um, and I used to dance in this castle years ago. Um, Bunratty is an example of how the story really engages. It's one of the top performing tourist destinations in Ireland. Um, Liz, I'm sure you've come across it. It's a real experience. You go down to Bunratty and they really bring the story to life. And I'm just going to play a few moments of this to give you a, a taste. To a new day. Open a precious window on our past. Step this back is quite in time into a world where your it's imagination takes life. Here is Ireland's most popular visitor attraction. A detailed and authentic recreation of country life at the turn of the century, where we remember our past and lovingly relive it. This school was originally built in Clare in the early 1800s. The master, Arl Unmoster, as he was known, was a respected figure in the village and presided over his pupil. Now, the reason I'm showing you that is if you go back to Bonratti today, you still get that same experience. It hasn't changed. Um, and for those of you that are Welsh that are on the call, that whole um, relationship there in that village is real life stuff if you live in Ireland. And I know it's something we have in common with Welsh vill villages as well, that everyone is related to everyone. But it, it really brings a really good sense of place, of location, of destination. And obviously that experience and that history story has evolved over the years, but it's still delivered in the same way that it always has been done, just with added technology and new pieces to the equation. Um, another entity that is working to tell, help people to tell stories is Celtic Roots. Um, and Ancient Connections. There are two other initiatives from the Ireland Wales Fund. We're the network element of it. Our focus is to provide that support and build that network. Um, but I, I'm going to mention those two entities later as well. 
Okay, so unfortunately, Dan and Beth Ann Jones can't be with us today because they have previous engagements. They have asked me to deliver their story on their behalf. They are the owners, and I hope, and please forgive me if I don't pronounce this correctly, they are the owners of Bragg D. Sibe, a microbrewery in Hollyhead. Barry, I'm sure you know them, or you've come across them, yeah. They run an amazing brewery business. They great move beer. On, sorry, Barry? Great beer. Yeah, great, oh, great beer, <laughs> good stuff. They moved to Hollyhead, this couple moved to Hollyhead in 2006 when Dan was relocated by his employer. And then he lost his job in 2019 and that was the catalyst for them to becoming self-employed and, and establishing the brewery that is now Brag D. Sibi. I, I do apologize, Barry, for not pronouncing that correctly. And then... Yeah, it's Cubby. Cubby, Cubby. Oh, okay, a very big Cubby. Without any background or experience in beer brewing, Dan set up um, to work at learning the craft. And there has been a massive, a massive uh, surge in many breweries and microbreweries in Ireland, as I'm sure anyone here will know. And I know the same is true on the Wales side. So we have, that's another commonality we have. They transformed a building in Hollyhead's William Street into a small brewery. Now that's no small feat. And this is what it looks like today. So in 2020, when the pandemic was happening, the brewery went from strength to strength and received, received great support from locals and people nationally in Wales and in the UK. And like, you know, many breweries, um, which is funny and sad at the same time, they nearly ran out entirely out of beer during the COVID. Um, so that's their story. But the one thing that they found as well, um, just from reading up on, on their stuff and listening to them, they're... They've, they've really, really monopolized on the story of the building they're in and the history and heritage of the area, right? Um, now, I'm going to get more detail on that and send it on to you as well. But it's a small little premises and it's now trading really, really well after two years. And they've used their story and their history and their heritage. Barry, you have a question? No, just a comment. They've actually moved premises now. They're yeah, no they're, longer, just, yeah. they're no longer in that little building. They have much larger uh, building in the uh, industrial estate, uh, so they enlarged their business uh, in, uh, substantially over yeah. the last year or so. And they've kept that story very much in it, Barry. They've kept. The oh story. yes, they they, they actually uh, arranged a, a folk reading evening. Uh, I think it's this week, and previously yeah, they, they've had uh, open evenings there for for groups. Uh, to, to come and visit them. So they are very much not only making beer, but they're also uh, engaged with the community and telling the stories of the community as well. They're very much uh, you know, embedded into the Welsh culture. And I think that's important, Barry. Um, you know, that's what I was going back to about location and embedding yourself into location in the community because there's a spot that, that helps you be stronger as a business. Um, Reaganman and Kilkenny in Ireland, we did a project with Kilkenny Tourism there um, last year around three or four different locations in their county. One of them was Reaganman. And Reaganman, one of the key things, and it was great to see the community in Reaganman is really, really at the heart and soul of the tourism effort down there. Um, they rec All the businesses recognize the value of the locals, bring them in. There's a lot of history in the area. No one knows the area like the locals. So it's very much at the heart and soul of what they do. Um, so it's a real pity they can't be there this morning. Um, okay, so I would like you to, to get ready for our first speaker. John O'Neill, I'd like to introduce you to John, who manages the Jeannie Johnston and also Dublin Discovered Boat Tours. He's in the boat this morning, literally, um, with his woolly hat on. And John has kindly agreed to, to talk to you a little bit about that. So with further ado, I'll hand it over to you, John. Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Max, for organising this workshop. Um, it's the first one I've joined in on. Um, it's a great range of people here here this morning. Um, I suppose, yeah, I've got, got to talk about what it is that uh, I do here in Dublin. Um, and you've got a nice slide up there of a picture of our um, sort of our premier attraction, which is the Jeannie Johnston Tall Ship, which is a, a three masted replica. Um, barkentine of a ship called the Jeannie Johnston that used to transport emigrants from Ireland back in the 1840s um, and the 1850s uh, to principally Canada. 
um, as part of our um, Ireland's emigration and uh, famine history and story. Um, we came across this ship in our guise as um, Dublin Discovered Boat Tours, um, which was back then uh, known as Liffey River Cruises, which was a small boat that takes people on a sightseeing cruise up and down the River Liffey. Um, and it started off, this particular boat, this started off in 2006. And our boat is this um, bespoke vessel that was designed to meet the tidal criteria and characteristics of the River Liffey um, in the city centre here to allow us to access um, all areas of the uh, river um, as much as possible. Uh, the River Liffey in Dublin is very, very tidal. Um, in fact, it used to be known as uh, on Roarhock, the raging bull of a river, um, before it was forded um, back in the 800s. Um, and as we were cruising up and down the river on our little boat, um, which was a vessel that was built by Dublin Docklands Development Authority, who were this sort of subcommittee of Dublin City Council back in the 90s, their brief was to um, turn Dublin's docklands into a, a viable commercial uh, quarter and an area where people could live and work. Um, up to then, it was dilapidated warehousing and um, old disused dockland. Um, and the reason they built our little boat was um, to be a vehicle for education of the city um, citizens of Dublin, because most people who live in Dublin tend to go to the hub. You, you can't see the docklands from the city centre. So um, the idea was to try and transport people down to this new part of the city. Um, and we've been doing that quite successfully for over 15 years now. Um, but uh, the Jeannie Johnston um, used to moor up here on the river when she came up from Tralee in 2005. And um, then in 2008, we all know what happened then. There was a horrendous uh, global financial collapse. Um, and the people who were operating the Genie Johnson then went out of business. Um, and we had our sort of eye on this ship, the Genie, um, more from a um, position of care because we were very, very worried that this vessel was going to disintegrate and fall apart and sink here in the River Liffey. Um, and we sort of felt that that wouldn't do. So we made a representation to the owners of the ship um, and saw permission to operate the vessel as a uh, an attraction um, and we bring visitors on board and tell them the story of the ship and uh, the Irish emigrant experience um, and they said yes um, and uh, we took it over um, they said yes on the um, 14th of July 2010 and we had tours up and running on the 16th of July 2010. Uh, we got people in here very, very quickly um, because we wanted to um, start working and earning funds to put into the restoration and refurbishment of the vessel. Um, and the Jeannie Johnston, um, she requires a lot of care and a lot of work. Um, so aside from just being a tourism activity or attraction provider, uh, we also are very heavily steeped in the engineering and the maintenance requirements of a tall ship like the Genie. Uh, we are in a difficult location in which to do that because we're um, up here in the city centre almost on the River Liffey. Uh, the vessel itself, um, she is now of a considerable age uh, in terms of timber tall ships. Um, she was originally constructed down in Kerry as a as a project um, between 1997 and 2003 in a place called Blennerville. Um, and where they built the ship was not a dockyard. They built it in a field beside a windmill. And they had to first construct um, workshops and yards and um, steam boxes and everything to bend and build and create these large timber frames that uh, go into the very fabric and hull of the ship. Um, the ship is constructed of oak frames up to um, a foot and a half, two foot thick in places, uh, huge, huge things. The ship is 40 metres long. Uh, she's eight metres wide. You know, she has a really, really deep draft. So she sits very low in the water. She's over 4.6 metres of the ship is invisible below the waterline. So a very, very big project. Um, and then when they finished the construction in um, 2003, this ship did set sail across the Atlantic and she did a tour of the east coast of the United States um, and Canada. And then she came back to Ireland and they, they sort of didn't have much of a purpose for her after that. Hence why she ended up working day sailing trips and stuff out of Dublin Port. And then when she was closed up for two years between 2008 and 2010, um, like any premises, if you close it up for long enough and don't let the air flow through, things start to de degrade and disintegrate. Um, so we have over the last few years dried off the ship in several occasions and reinstated planks that had gone rotten, planks that were broken, and um, things that were damaged and done an awful lot of work on it. 
you see on this slide here some lovely images of the construction of the ship and you get a lovely sense of the scale involved a very very large um ship um, it's also worth noting that uh, this vessel was um part of a greater project it was part of a uh, cross-border uh, peace and reconciliation process uh, for the communities in the north of Ireland and people in the south of Ireland. It was um, part of a FOSS. FOSS was the um, Irish sort of jobs agency um, back then. Uh, they used to take in apprentices and train them up in the skill and the craft of shipwrights. Um, this ship, through all of its endeavours and projects during the construction, touched an awful lot of people's lives and made great changes for them and took people who would have always gone down rather bad roads in their lives and put them on a on a good path. Um, so she had this huge um, amount of, uh, there is a huge amount of goodwill out there for the ship as well. Um, and as you can see there, um, just in the last little point in that slide, um, <clears throat> The ship laid up in the financial crash. We opened it up to tours, as I previously mentioned, and commencing maintenance. Uh, and that's what we do day to day. We, we bring people on board. We tell them the story of the Irish <clears throat> emigrant and the reasons why they were leaving the country. And uh, we we refurbish the vessel. We rebuild her. Um, in 2014 and 2000, between 2014 and 2016, we had to rebuild the entire transom, which is the stern area of the ship. Um, but because there's no dry docks on the side of the country that can craft ship because we have to do it all afloat, afloat, which means that you have to invent ways of doing all these things afloat. Because most people, when you say, what do you do? How do you repair a tall ship? Um, you know, they say you put them to a dry dock. Well, we, we don't have that option here. So we have to come up with all these um, slightly quirky um, bespoke engineering practices to do what we need to do to, to, to salvage the vessel. Um, the work, as you can imagine, with a um, tall ship that's made out of timber is uh, never ending. And rather relentless. So our, our refurbishment work is, is ongoing in tandem with our day-to-day -day activity as a um, an attraction provider. Um, the ship and its background story is not entirely Ireland specific. It's every country has a history of emigration or immigration. Every country has had tragedy or catastrophe in the past that has necessitated the movement of people from one side of the world to the other. Um, our ship was born out of, the original Jeannie Johnson was born out of commercial need for timber in Europe. And um, so they used to build uh, these ships up in the shipyards in Quebec and Canada. And um, they, they were designed purely as hooks to load up with as much timber as possible and bring back across the Atlantic. And then they would usually go back as empty holes uh, to the forestries in Canada and take more timber back across. During the mass exodus of the 1840s and 1850s, um, the ship owners were, of course, um, only too delighted to have fair paying passengers to bring back over um, before they loaded up with more timber. Um, the reason why the Genie Johnston was built as a replica and selected as a replica was because most of the vessels that were doing this transatlantic crossing um, during that period of time were referred to as coffin ships. Um, most people who went on board these ships didn't survive the voyage um, and they would have been unceremoniously uh, buried at sea for the most part. It was a fairly ruthless practice, um, but the Genie Johnston was different in far that she never ever lost a single life and nobody ever died on board which is a remarkable achievement and because you know working on one of these ships even as crew in the 1840s was a perilous undertaking you know people would die going aloft they get washed over the sides they would perish at sea there would be illness there would be typhus there'd be cholera and um, all sorts of things like that but the genie johnson didn't have these issues on board because she had carried a doctor. He's there at the bottom uh, uh, right picture on the slide, Dr. Brenner has it. Um, he sailed with the vessel. And he also, him and Captain Attridge, who's the man just there in the black and white um, top uh, second from the right picture, um, they very much um, encouraged good hygiene on board. And they let people out from below the hole to tidy up the gear and get fresh air and all sorts of things. Um, and while the Jeannie Johnson didn't lose anybody um, on her voyages, she actually gained one person. She actually gained, um, you see the bottom left picture there, that's a lady called Margaret Royal. She gave birth to her first son on day one of the maiden voyage that Jeannie Johnson with passengers across to uh, Quebec. And she was so grateful to the care, uh, to the crew for the care they took of her on the voyage that she named 
her son after every single member of the crew and company on board the vessel. The boy has 19 first names. And now I can't rattle them all off. Uh, my tour guides can. His name is Nicholas Donovan Riley. Now, very, very fantastically, um, a few years ago, we had received communication from the States, from this lady, uh, a lady called Ellen. And she was a great, great, great grandniece of Nicholas Donovan Riley. And she was able to send us photographs of him in his own bar in Pittsburgh. Two years later, we had um, visitors, a man called John Riley from the States came over and was on board. He says, my, my great, great, great grandfather was born on the ship. And he was there with his family and his daughter who was pregnant with the next generation of Nicholas Donovan Riley's progeny. So all these people have come back and found us and come back to the ship. And there are many, many more of these people out there. So um, we tell our stories to everybody who comes and visits. People really appreciate the time they get to spend on board. We're a very simple experience insofar as that our museum is not you know, all singing and all dancing. We have a few mannequins in there and that represent the conditions people would have traveled in. But the stories our guides tell and how they tell them produce this extraordinarily emotive response in everybody who comes on board. And every so often out of the woodwork comes somebody like John Riley and his daughter. And um, it's, you know, so the ship continues to reach people. Um, and as I say, it's not entirely Ireland specific. Um, it has resonance for um, people who are interested in the maritime sphere inside of things. It has residents for people who are interested in a worldwide diaspora, irrespective of their own country of origin or where they hail from. Um, and, you know, we, we do our best to, to, to manage these stories and tell these stories and keep the ship busy. Um, we operate in a very challenging environment. Um, as everyone who's involved in tourism knows, the last two years has been very very difficult um like our river cruise boat doesn't discover boat tours because of the restrictions placed in ireland couldn't operate at all for two years um the genie johnson we managed to salvage a little bit from 2021 because we were able to convert and you know redesign our tour and flow on board to conduct everything outdoors we had the luxury of the outdoor space we were able to do that but we were working with very limited numbers because our typical onboard group size was slashed in half to allow for all of the social distancing that was required in that. But still people came, you know, still people came and visited. They wanted something to do. Um, this year, um, as Mags alluded to earlier on, um, was a little bit unusual. And next year is also going to be a little bit unusual because our company has been around for a long, long time. We've been around for um, since 2000, uh, the year 2000. And um, we have all this huge history of visitor numbers and patterns and how people come and how people travel and what they expect to do when they get to places. And all of it is redundant now because we don't know what the trends are going to be from now on. The trends have all changed somewhat. So we are faced with, um, you know, trying to get an understanding of how people are going to travel next year. Uh, we had a very good year this year, I must say, because it was the visitor numbers were much higher than expected. Um, we thought it would be a little bit more of a, a softer start than it was, but clearly people were tired of their own locale and needed to get out and travel and broaden their horizons again. And they've done so rather relentlessly all year long and the numbers have sort of kept up. It's starting to flag now as we head into winter and people turn their thoughts towards Christmas and that. Um, and there is a slight worry um, that, you know, this boost that we've seen is, 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 is a pent up demand or a response to being cooped up for so long. And we are very hopeful that it will carry on through into um, 2023 and beyond because and that it's a pickup of where we left things off in 2019. 2019 for me on the river cruise and on the Genie was the biggest year we'd ever had in all our years of trading in terms of visitor numbers. Um, and it was also an extremely big year for Dublin inbound tourism. Massive numbers came to visit. And I think masses of people were traveling to many, many destinations um, in 2019. I think everywhere I saw a rather large surge or influx of people. Um, and maybe 2023 will pick that up again 
and run with it. Um, and I hope so uh, for everybody. Uh, or, you know, there is a little bit of uncertainty there, which is, you know, sort of we kind of have to build into what we expect um, next year. But, uh, you know, tourism is an ever optimistic business. Um, and uh, we plan for we plan for good numbers of visitors. We plan for having good product out there. We plan for having people enjoying themselves. Um, and we plan to um, continue to develop and maintain the ship and develop our tour. Uh, we work in tandem with local partners here in the um, city to uh, do our sales and marketing and that sort of stuff. And we're looking at um, revisiting all of the plans we have put on hold in 2020, which are things like you know upgrading our museum, upgrading the visitor experience, upgrading how we deliver our product. But it's a it's a sensitive um, approach we have to take because we don't want to undermine or diminish the response we receive from our visitors or, or, or how our story is told or, or, or the, the importance of the story that we tell. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a particularly delicate piece of history and that has to be handled a certain way. Um, and I think we have it just right, but we can enhance the, the experience somewhat in terms of, you know, giving people more of this information and not restricting their access to it. Um, so, yeah, um, that's great. That's us here on the river. And um, I hope that wasn't too rambly. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask away. Can I just Thanks. make one point, um, mm -hmm. John? There's something I wrote down here. Um, I might I might actually do a call with you at another stage, but because I have a little idea. But there was one thing I wrote down here. Um, that the, the genie has fundamentally done by the sounds of it, it has helped change people's lives. So from taking people across the water and getting them there in one piece, which I have to be honest, I did not know that, that about the genie that it had not lost any passengers. That's mm -hmm. quite mad and unusual, mm -hmm. but really positive. But one of the things there you mentioned there, and it was something that kind of, hit me when you said it that when all the refurbishment was happening there in after 2008 and 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 even before that that you brought on false workers and that it changed people's lives so that's part of its story as well um, and I don't know if you referenced that but I think it might be if you don't it might be something to think about because it's just making it relatable again and bringing a new uh, chapter into the the story. Yeah. Um, just just on that, Max. Sorry, I I I um I, I might have um crossed your wires a little bit there. I I can't take credit for the Foss workers. That was part of the um the original build of the ship. Um, mm -hmm. and now you're right that the ship did change people, but I certainly can't um um say I I did that because when when they started constructing the ship in 1997. Uh, down in Blennerville in Tralee, they, they built this whole program. And ultimately the goal originally was to have the project be the building of the ship in this field. Um, and then they got involved in a lot of millennium projects and that sort of stuff. And, you know, the idea for the transatlantic voyage was there. Um, and it was, they, they used what they were doing to um, partake in their own way of the Good Friday Agreement, you know, and they 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 took people from north south uh, communities, they took people from the east west communities of Belfast and brought them down and linked them in with um, kids who would have been working on false training schemes here, um, and brought them down and taught them how to become um, shipwrights and ships crew. Um, so they they did that side of stuff, um, and I think it's, it's an important thing to recognise in in in. It was something that happened during the build of the vessel, um, but it wasn't me, unfortunately. No, 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 I, um, I know that, yeah. I know that, but it's yeah. just for reference that at some point, mm. because it's something that I know for a fact, John, mm. and I know for a fact from talking to people across the world about how things have changed in terms of tourism marketing, mm. that is something, it's just, I suppose, you'd have to be careful how you say it, but it's definitely something that I, I, I'm just going to note it there. Mm. For you. So oh, thank yeah. you so much yeah. for sharing that. Um, no problem. Uh, that's that's a really nice story. I've been up to the genie lads and uh, it's quite an interesting um, spot. 
uh, it's a very empower. It's a very has a proud presence, and um, the sheer size of it is was quite strong. And um, so I think it's well worth a visit. Um, and I just put in a, a, a quote there. Our stories may be similar, but our destination is there. And can somebody as an interference come in? I think I'm gone. Um, so thanks again, John, for that really brief stage. So now I want to introduce you to a little powerhouse called Liz Jones. Liz is, um, are you in Connecticut? Liz? Am I right to say that? I, I am at the moment in Connecticut, yes. So thank you so much, because I know the time difference is not pretty. Um, and it's a lot earlier out there than it is here. So thanks for hopping on this. And Liz is going to share the story of how herself and her husband Gordon have taken chickens and taken it from what it was in the past to what it is now. So I'll hand it over to you, Liz. Sure. Uh, there's still a, a bit of background noise uh, on the phone. So hopefully folks can hear me okay. Uh, so yeah, we, th this is uh, this is us in front of the castle, Gordon and myself, in this year. So this is a, a far cry from where it was, and this is us. And uh, we're usually in a somewhat uh, slightly disheveled state uh, because we're still doing construction. Go ahead to the next slide, though. Thanks. So just some background points. We won't read all of this, but uh, we do live in the, in America uh, part time. Uh, as the years go on, we spend more and more time in Ireland, but we uh, decided to retire there. I'm not uh, yet retired, so we I kind of do this project part-time. Gordon does it more full-time. And uh, we've been there over the years. Gordon does have some Irish ancestry and actually some Welsh, which we'll talk about. Um, so he, we, we bring different skills. So uh, I, ni neither one of us had done anything really with building too much except our own more modern build here. Uh, I swore we'd never do anything like that. Or at least Gordon swore he'd never ever do a house build again. Well, okay, we built a, did a castle instead. Uh, I'm a project manager by trade, so that does bring some help into it. And uh, Gordon's a professional musician uh, and ambulance uh, worker. So uh, we did look for a number of years uh, in, in uh, Ireland, uh, wandered around looking at various uh, castles of various uh, types, including ones that were really uh, just very small piles of rock that I thought were enchanting because they were less expensive. And Gordon said, no, you're absolutely mad. Um, that story was actually told on a television show in America called uh, House Hunters International. Now, I will say that that was two thirds fantasy. Uh, you know, reality shows are not always reality, as we know, uh, but uh, sometimes you can find it on YouTube, uh, Castle Hunting in Ireland. So two of the sites we saw in that in that film actually are not sites that we saw. We only saw ruins. Uh, like this wonderful photo uh, down below that was actually taken by our stonemason, who we didn't know at the time, uh, Michael Carroll. And that's what the property looked like. It was uh, totally ruined, with no roofs, doors, windows, plumbing, anything. Um, so because I'm a project manager, you know, we did create a project plan and uh, with four phases. So purchase, planning permissions, construction, and then living history. Originally, our goal was not to really do it as a business and tourism we always wanted to share it with people so we always wanted to have like living history events and community events but we really weren't necessarily sure about running it as a business um that came as part of a grant that we got during the construction phase and uh wexford county council and was was keen on us to open it because we are on the norman way and we're one of the only sites that's actually open on the norman way so uh, we're in phase four now, but we're also sort of in phase three. A lot of times these phases overlap uh, in life and uh, they do still with us. Uh, we still have one more building to go. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, construction and build, well, that is, uh, you know, all of the phases take a while. Looking for it, uh, planning permission took a year and a half for two years. So here we are, and actually this was, it was our fourth year of building. And so we're really sick of construction, but we can't stop yet because um, 
it's hard to stop when you're three quarters of the way through, even though the money flow is way more than we want or really planned. Uh, one advantage is that we do, we always plan to only work six months out of the year. Um, it's, you know, the uptime, downtime, just like with tourism, uh, because of the weather, because of our living in the United States also and our obligations here, uh, family, work, et cetera. So uh, that has really helped. And in, in a strange way, it definitely helped with COVID because, um, you know, with all the lockdowns and all that, we just came over and did uh, phases either, okay, we switched to things we could do ourselves or learn to do, or we waited till lockdown had relieved and then people came on site. But it also gave us a really uh, contemplative time each year to sort of think about, okay, what do we want to do next year? What's important? What can we afford to do? Um, so we do have four buildings and uh, these are them basically a tower, which is the main attraction. That's, that's what draws us there. And as much as I, we try to put sort of minimum amounts of money into the tower, minimum efforts into the tower it calls to us it's like the the pirate gold it calls to us and it says put more money into me put more effort into me um the big house which is a 17th century uh build late 17th century and is now it really was a shell and is now a, a sort of hybrid of new and old connecting uh the new build uh section to the tower and then um, there is a fourth building, which we hope to do this year, which is what we call an agricultural building, was an old barn. Uh, so this is, you see on this slide, basically what we did more or less each year. So yeah, four years of construction and uh, hopefully in 2023, we have to decide because our planning permissions expire, like are we just gonna push through and, and try to get this agricultural building done? Uh, so this story, you could actually see it was, we were lucky to have these television shows uh, with these really nice people wanting to film our story. So it was a, an hour show on the Great House Revival on RTE1. That's still available on RTE uh, Player. And uh, Hugh Wallace, we had a great time. He loves to dress up and uh, <laughs> we like to dress up too because we're reenactors and that's what drew us to castles to begin with. So you can see that story there. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, just a little bit about the Wales connection, because when we found out about this project uh, and were connect, uh, asked earlier in the year if we wanted to be part of it, um, at, coincidentally, I had done a number of uh, bits of research. I actually went on my birthday uh, in 2018 on this whirlwind tour of driving into Wales on my own uh, after flying into London and sort of whizzing around uh, Wales to find a place near Cowbridge called Sigginstone or Trey Sigan, um, and I don't know how to exactly to say it in Welsh, but uh, we've been there a couple of times now because it is it is our thought, it is my thought that see, the um, the Siggins who built Siggenstown did come from Southeast Wales. And that's documented in very, well, we think it's uh, th that, that migration of people is documented in, in various places. There's so many townland names like Siggenstown that are identical in Southeast uh, mm -hmm. Wales. So, uh, and Hugh Sigan, uh, Llantwit, I've learned to sort of say that, Llantwit, I understand, in Glamorgan, the Vale of Glamorgan, he's a juror. Now, they disappeared. Um, I would love to find, if we talk about those, uh, those students in university in Wales, I would love to find a, a Welsh-speaking medieval student uh, who could do a lot more research in, in medieval Wales and dig up more, because I have no Welsh, so that's difficult. Um, so uh, we and we also found in a new time that there are photos that people have brought us from people who have emigrated to Wales and England uh, who, who show the castle in earlier times. So we're always on the lookout for photos of the castle in earlier periods, which are hard to find. Um, Rossler Port is 15 minutes away from us. So that's uh, that's really helpful. And now that it's kind of growing we want to take more of uh, the time to go on the ferry. So actually we went there this year, we were a part of a castle studies group tour to Wales and we went back to Cowbridge and Singstown. I drug Gordon around. I said, see, see, look at, look, there's the sign. And I can imagine them driving or, or walking down these roads. 
so anyways, we have documented some of those stories on our YouTube channel, which I need to do more on, on searching for SIGINS. So go ahead. So uh, what, what happens uh, now? I mean, well, stories going forward. So we would like to expand. We, we did open for tourism in 2022, and that was challenging because, you know, we're still doing construction. So we have to tell people, you know, you're on a construction site, please see, sign a safety waiver, don't go near the scaffolding, don't mind the workers. Um, and we're open on weekends, um, not usually during the week when construction work is going on. But, um, you know, basic tours, we knew we wanted to do that. We were encouraged to do that, but they're very static. You know, you see, you see rooms that are not occupied. We have tried to put um, mostly replica furniture so that people can sit at the tables. We don't have an environment where you can't touch. You know, we, we have to climb up 55 steps if you want to get to the top of the tower. So we want people to be able to sit down in a room to rest and to tell the story perhaps of each room and our renovation. Um, so we, um, we have told the, the stories in the past about a lot of uh, our story, of course, how we found it, how we have renovated it. Also the people who have volunteered and also our contractors because a lot of them come from the community. So we're, that's been wonderful for us because they have an interest in seeing this building survive. And some of them are connected, uh, you know, as their families were, were descendants of the castle. But what we want to do going forward, a uh, little, little photo in the bottom there, uh, we would like to have more experiences in the castle. So we talked about Von Raddy earlier. It's interesting because that's at a scale that we cannot replicate. Obviously, we cannot start a folk park and all of that. We're interested in all those trades and crafts, but we cannot do all of them uh, there. So we want to focus on the ones that um, we can do mostly our, our own skills. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, characters coming, hopefully this, this coming year um, and uh, telling the stories of uh, historical beverages and things that we can manage on a smaller scale. Our, our real interest is that people get to experience these rooms as they might have been, you know, obviously a bit of fantasy in uh, a time period. So you get to feel that and you get to be, have candlelight and you get to eat and drink potentially or have music in the tower and in some of these other spaces, including the big house. So that's what we're looking for in 2023. We'll see how we get to it. And um, just really excited about uh, doing some of this and connecting with some of the folks you know, we certainly understand uh, that the tower needs a lot of care and feeding uh, going forward, just like the Jeannie Johnson. Oh, and I see we've got some additional photos. <laughs> yes, of, of how, how kind of the journey has gone. Thanks, Mags. I just unmute myself, apology. Liz, that's great. That's really great. I've read up a lot on, and I have somebody I'm going to introduce you to in terms of um Welsh speaking who can do some more research um they're they're involved in the University of Aberystwyth in Glamorgan is actually the Centre for Cultural Studies and Heritage in Wales so I have somebody there that I'd be happy to introduce you to um I love to see that I love to see something that's built and is continuing like John's um initiative up in the Jeannie Johnston you've made history um survive I suppose to the present day so that's fantastic and you reminded me of another story ladies and gents that I want to quickly tell you about a business in Galway in Hedford it's a cafe called the home place and it's owned by a very very good friend of mine called Orla Keane Orla Keane she is uh, from the singers the singing family the musicians the Keanes Dolores Keane Matt Keane and Orla is a chef by trade and she took me up to see the property before she opened it and she said do you think I'm mad and I said well you're a musician and you're a chef so you're going to have to improvise here you're going to have to balance the two out so she said can you help me I said absolutely and as a friend I, I rode in and I and I helped her and she said to me I want to do something it's called the home place for a reason the home place it came out of a song that Orla sings and who will watch the home place and if you look her up she's an amazing voice um and 
it's one of my favorite songs that she actually sings so it was lovely to see her name the place after that she's an exceptional chef but also what she is is an exceptional natural born organic entertainer so I said to her have you thought about doing session suppers and she said I thought about doing music didn't know quite know what to do it lads she started session suppers people come in now and they have their meal and they get the best of food and there's a session in the kitchen it's they brought the music into the old way of living in Ireland I suppose where music was very much part of our life and we just did a new house built here in a historic site belonging to my husband's family and I only found out through the house build that this house was known as the session house years ago um everyone used to come to play cards have a few drinks play music and that was done down through the centuries with the same family my husband's family and you you know that gives it a bit of soul so when Orla went into that she didn't expect it to be as successful as it is and it was a simple thing and she told the story as well of the history of the people who had been trading in the facility before her but she also brought the history of song heritage and music into the equation something she knows a lot about so it's something I look it up it's it's and I'll share it with you all after this yeah Jenny is sharing the link there but it's just another example of using your own story in your business or in the business that you own manage oversee or you're part of to drive it on and to drive it forward and as you can probably tell um, and I apologize like I'm passionate about that piece I see potential and I like it to be capitalized upon um so Liz that was a great great one down there told in a very natural way as well so thank you Getting back to storytelling as a concept, and some people who don't understand the tourism sector often describe this as bullshit or BS. And my reply to that is, well, if it's bullshit or BS, it's bullshit and BS that has helped a lot of people create a livelihood, uh, support their local economy, support their community, and build a successful business. What you need to know for storytelling you need to look at how do you create your business story and you need to take time to, as I said earlier on, write it out, R-I-T-E, to write it out, R-I-G-H-T. We have a program called Write It Out to Write It Out um, and that's, that's the title of it. But in that, you need to actually sit down and look, okay, not just the history, but your story in the business, your story in the business. And I always encourage people, have this in your marketing. Use this piece. People want to deal with people. They like to know who they're handing their money over to. They want to know, well, what's the background to this? What's going to make it interesting and unique? The importance is to have a story that engages your ideal client or guest and not the masses. If it does, great. But it's never going to engage proficiently with all the masses and turn it into business. Your ideal client or guest is different depending on your business and your market, right? So Liz, in your respect, and, and John, I'm going to use you two as examples. So Liz, with respect to your business, someone who might like reenactment, who's into history, who's got young family that might like the fun side of that history piece, the tower could be a fun piece for kids. Make it animated and interesting. For if you have a family market that you're going after, then how do you make the story relatable to the family market? How do you make the story relatable to the reenactment market, which is quite big, and also to the military market, people who are interested in military history? And with the Jeannie Johnston, John, and I know you know this inside out, that would be um, a big piece as well. People who have that interest in that, you know, maritime history, military history, Dublin history genealogy history when it goes to you know those who sailed in that ship and made new lives for themselves in other continents and other countries what are the benefits of developing your story for your business your location your region what can it help to do for your business your location and your region okay so can you collaborate with Shigginstown I could definitely see a collaborative piece there with the Welsh side the Jeannie Johnston definitely see a collaborative piece there with the likes of Hollyhead, Pembrokeshire. And um, active Pembrokeshire in particular, it's a very active port. And how can you develop 
something that's going to benefit those three pieces, your business, your location, your region, and I'll throw another one in there, your community. So a lot of the ports, we five ports in the ports past and present. There's always, ports traditionally always have a disadvantaged area in the mix. Um, coastal areas are like that. It's the same in Limerick where I come from. We have a port down in Fines and a port coming into Limerick. And there's a disadvantaged, a working class area there that has suffered through different times of job losses, um, regeneration or degeneration. So how can you work to support the progress in that respect? What types of storytelling can be used? And are there any rules that you should stick to? What types of storytelling? Do you bring it in in a video piece? Do you bring it in in a written piece? Do you create a soft copy storybook for the family market? Do you create, um, as I said earlier on, a maritime piece for those who are into that? Do you do it online? Can you do it online and offline? The one thing I would say to you here is, and this is something I feel strongly about, don't put all your eggs in one basket when you're doing your marketing and your storytelling. And you'll hear this again and again and again from me. Do the hybrid model. Remember that people are getting exhausted from just pure 100% online. They want real stuff too. They can get that online, but bring it down to offline as well. You know, balance that out. And we're seeing that more and more now across the board with research and also with businesses we're working with. What destination storytelling is and how the local community is powerful in your business story. Bring them into it. Invite them into it. You know, it's not about you pushing yourself at them. It's about the inclusive piece. Make your business and your story accessible for everybody, if that makes sense. Anyone got a question there? I can hear some people. Ben. Oh, you thought, you're saying about Pembrokeshire. Um... The docks there, well, Pembrokeshire is actually quite linked in to Liverpool and Ireland. Because yeah. uh, we've got uh, one of my ancestors, Captain James Morgan, not linked to the pirate or the alcohol. So I had family joke that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's something it's in health in family joke, but he his family was actually from a farm in uh, San Rian in down in Pembrokeshire near Sauvon St. David's. And he ended up being a ship's captain. Um, and so from Liverpool and everything. And then from Anglesey, I've got another uh, ship's pilot from sort of, uh, north side of Anglesey again to Liverpool. So you've got all these interlinked things. And mm. then a family member who was born and bred in Liverpool, she went down on the Lusitania. So again, through history, you do have these interlinked things. Um, and it's, I mean, I do a lot of genealogy, so you start seeing all these micro linked things between family connections. And I, as you said, it uh, photographs are really useful because people go, Oh, didn't spot that before. So it's those little nuggets, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and using those nuggets as well. Because if you don't use them, people will never know about them. Um, and you can't capitalize on them either if you don't use them. And they're things that will engage curiosity. They will engage engagement. Um, and it will help people to take a closer look at what you're offering and your location, what your location offers in terms of a, a whole well-rounded experience, not just about your business. Your business is part of their location experience, but Tell them a little bit about the location around your business, that story as well, if that makes sense. Thanks, Beth, for that. Um, okay, so what's your story, right? So I've just put a couple of tips there um, about telling your story online and offline. And unfortunately, I can't go into, we have a limited time frame, but digital destination story tips, know your audience. I have a thing, H2H, human to human. Remember that you're dealing with a person. You're communicating with a person every single time, not just a platform. It's a person behind the keyboard, okay? And it's important to remember that. Make the customer the hero when you're telling your story. And what I mean by that is bring them into it. Make it central, make it relative to them. I mentioned at the start, 
thoughtful and mindful storytelling. Be very mindful of how you tell the story. And John mentioned it there earlier on. So, you know, you have to handle your stories with, with kid gloves sometimes and with care. Um, you know, people say to me, oh, you can massage the truth. You can, yeah. But <laughs> is that right sometimes? Um, massaging the truth within reason, I would always say. Um, but just be very mindful of the story you're telling and the people that are in the mix. Go local, whether you're in Wales or whether you're in Ireland, it doesn't bloody matter. Support local, go local. Look at your community. Bring stories from the community into the mix that are relative to your business. OK, and invite those stories in. After this workshop, um, with everyone's kind permission, I'm going to um, Alva, who is working for the University College Cork, they're one of the stakeholders in the Ports Past and Present Initiative. They're looking for uh, story opportunities from everybody. So they may contact you to tell your story that would be included, included on the website for Ports Past and Present and also on the app. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Collaborate and be unique. And that project that we did in Kilkenny, the remit was to help businesses in three locations to develop unique experience offers for people coming to Ireland and coming to Kilkenny. And by God, Jenny's sitting across from me here this morning, by God did we, did we develop three unique offerings with those businesses. And it was a really lovely collaborative experience. We've done it in Tipperary and I've done it up the north as well to bring people in and get them to encourage and empower positive collaboration and bring in uniqueness and something that's going to make them stand out in the right way. Be visual. Bets related there to, to photographs. Use your photographs. Use video. Video is now right ahead of text online. And that's starting to change again now. So we've got to keep ahead of the posse insofar as we can. This doesn't have to be a pressure piece. It's about simple little things that you can do and get them right one step at a time. OK, so that's the digital side. Now, there's a bit of cross over here with the offline. So the offline destination story connections, again, the community connection, keeping it real. If you're going to put something on paper or you're going to present yourself in the person in front of an audience, keep it real. People can see when you're telling them a lie. <laughs> All right. Make it relative to them. Make it relative in this day and age as well as much as in the past and in the future. Right. And one of the things about Ports Past Present Initiative is the, the pieces of media that they have developed that I'm going to speak about in a moment that you can use to help your story. It's about taking what's in the past and in the present and helping it to sustain your business in the future, right? These three, well, the first word in the next sentence is authentic. People are sick and tired of hearing that word authentic in the sector. Uh, I know in Ireland we're, we're demented from it, but it does have its place. Tell the authentic story. Remember the emotional piece and remember that personal connection with people. OK, um, create stories that are going to create dimension um, to the experience that you offer in a different, unique and real time way. Look at your story and say, well, how can I keep that story but bring a different dimension into the mix? Does that make sense? Um, a little fact for you, in recent research among visitors and business owners in the sector, 74% said that driving intention to visit is the main goal for destination storytelling. It is the main goal. But if you don't tell the story in the right way, it won't happen. Create story collateral that is relevant and attractive. So what I mean by that is if you're doing a physical piece like piece of paper like this, or a DL brochure, like that size, right? It needs to be relevant, first of all, which means that it's useful. It's not a piece of paper they're gonna light the fire with. So I'm gonna show you something, and I'm just back from holidays um, in Spain of all places. I needed a bit of sunshine. And one of the things that they gave us was an app. Now, 
I hate getting handed pieces of collateral as a visitor myself that are just, they're a waste of paper. I kept that because it's a useful reference for um, other projects that we'll be doing, but it's also something that I used throughout my holiday and it was attractive. It was pocket sized, you could put it in your wallet, fold it up to put it in your wallet, but it was nice and bright to look at. And it had all the information I needed. And it was the only thing I needed to navigate my way around the area while I was there. So create collateral, absolutely. But make sure it's relevant and it's attractive. Okay. Some useful links that I know you're not going to get a chance to jot down. I'll share this with you all afterwards. Um, Falcha Ireland has a big resource there and they have a very good uh, file I'm sure John you're probably familiar with it already how to help visitors experience your story it's a very very simple outline on how to tell your story and how to set it out um, another piece that we're going to provide to you is a video from Switzerland on how an entity over there tells their story a business entity in the tourism sector and an interesting article from the BBC cutting edge tourism model that's in Newfoundland. So those pieces we're going to share with you. And there's other resources as well and opportunities. So the first one, obviously, the reason why we're all here is the Ports Past and Present media listing. So Jenny is gonna share out a list of those media pieces um, and video pieces. They're only as good as the use you make of them. If you can bring them into your story, bring them into your story. So I can't make anybody do that and nobody can make anybody do that. But I would encourage you to do that if, if at all, if you see the value in it. These are professionally produced pieces. They are a free resource, free to everybody that's part of the network. Use them in your business if you see the relevance. Why not? Um, and there's pieces there on Dublin, on the Wexford coast, on Pembrokeshire, on Hollyhead and on Fishguard. Um, there's also the Ports Path and Present app. In another upcoming webinar, we will have the person who developed that app, James, on to talk to us about the app and how to use the app in your business. And this, again, I like anything that's a bit progressive and that's smart, that's thinking smart, that's helping you to work smart as a business. So this app will give you the opportunity to upload your own profile, your own content, and engage with people on their phone. We all use our phones. We all, if you're like me, you have a list of apps um, that you use. And I will delete apps if they're of no use to me, but I will keep the ones that I know I'm going to use over time, okay? Falcha Ireland has its insights there from the Irish side. On the Welsh side, um, can I, can I, please help me here, Barry, how do I pronounce, I should know I lived in Wales. How do I pronounce that word correctly? Which word are you looking for? The Kymru. What about? Here. Cymru. Cymru. Cymru, Cymru Wales. Cymru. Cymru Wales, okay. <laughs> so that's the equivalent of Falch Ireland in Wales. They have a massive uh, bank and library that you can access um, to get resources from. And also, I want to, I'm going to go into, if I can, just bear with me a minute now. I can't go into it here, but I will share a link to the Falch Ireland um, resources and Cambridge Wales resources as well. I'll share that with you afterwards. And um, there's another, there's an upcoming workshop that's been delivered by Marianne Constantine from the University of Aberystwyth, who would might be one of the people to refer you to, Liz, in terms of heritage. Um, and she is going to be delivering a free workshop on creative writing around storytelling. If you're interested in that, um, we will share out the details to you and it's coming, I can't remember the date, the 5th of December um, and it's well worth looking at if you're serious about looking at your story. There's other resources like Celtic Roots um, which are looking at the history of areas as well and, and ancient connections. They have massive resource library. One of them has over 1300 images and video pieces that are free to use as well. So if you need those links, please let us know. Um, it's all about, I know that, you know, the, the Ports Path to Present initiative is to help positive networking and positive collaboration. 
But I also want to look at how these how businesses can help themselves to progress in the area that they trade in, um, in their community and in themselves. So again, a reminder, remember the success stories. I mentioned the home place, Secret Valley Wildlife Park, Bonratty Castle, and just on Bonratty there it is. Um, the castle is quite separate from the rest of the park. And they have a very small team, a very small team. A really good friend of mine was a tour guide there for years. It's really basic stuff. So you, you have a very lovely piece similar to that castle because they don't have, a lot of the castle is gone. Um, whether you realize that or not, it's not a huge mass of property. So, you know, Shigginstown can give it welly as well. Um, remember the relevance of your story to your brand. You're building a brand, something that people can identify with. Polish the hidden gems and look for those hidden gems. They're there. They're there. And um, look for them. Use them. Polish them up. Make them relevant. Remember and think about how can your story help you to change, through challenge, and through connection in a consistent way. Remember that your community counts. It's, it's all about location experience now. It's not just about, right, I'm going to go to the Jeannie Johnston, or I'm going to go to Shigginstown Castle or I'm gonna to go to Bonratty Castle. If they go to any of those areas, or if they go up to Hollyhead, they're not just going to the Maritime Museum. They're gonna look at the location. Likewise in Dublin, in the vicinity, and I know that John, you do great work with this, you know, collaborating with businesses around you um, and trying to. Uh, it's building that as a package experience, as a location experience for people. How can you partner up with others in your community and in your locality to bring a stronger offering to the table with your story. Connecting the past, the past is always going to be there and history buffs are constantly there. They're go that's going to be a fact of life. But remember that we have to engage the audiences coming up the ranks now, like ourselves, in a different way in terms of history. How do we make it relevant? How do we make it how do we make our story engaging, okay? And remember to plan, write it out to write it out, write it down. And these two pieces, I'm obsessed with giving the audience something they don't see coming, okay? Now granted, Jordan likes to surprise people with horror stories, I'm not, I'd be hiding behind the couch, but the same principle applies. Give them something that, you know, they're not going to expect. Um, marketing is no longer about the stuff that you make or the physical offering. It's about the intangible stuff. It's about the stories you can tell. Would anyone like to ask questions? Anyone at all have a question? Barry. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can indeed. Yes, can. That lovely Welsh lilt. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, in, in our Maritime Museum, we, we have a distinct approach where uh, we have guides uh, interacting with our visitors and we tell the story uh, verbally as much as uh, let them wander around and, and read for themselves. And it's, it's part of our, uh, our success, we feel, is that we, we, we do it that way. We're not a museum where people walk in and there's nobody there to talk to. So we, we, we've always, we're always telling stories and many of our volunteers have that personal connection with these stories as well. And I think So I think, you know, we go along with, with what you're saying, you know, tell the story and, and we always try to do that. What we are failing at, if, if that's the word, is that we do very well with visitors coming to the museum from elsewhere. We have difficulty engaging locally with, with people who live in and around Hollyhead. Maybe it's because they already know the stories, but it's yeah. difficult, we find it difficult to get them to come to the museum. Have you got any sort of thoughts on that sort of uh, um, I do. problem? Yeah, I do. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say to you, Barry, is uh, I'm delighted to hear you do the face-to-face -face piece. Um, and I'm delighted that you have that resource there because uh, the big, one of the biggest challenges in the, in the marketplace at the moment is finding people that can actually engage with the public. 
um, and I'm sure no one here would disagree with that. Um, it's, it, you're in a very good position in that respect. When it comes to the local community, you have to put yourself in their shoes, right? Um, and, and just and do that from a real objective viewpoint. Where are they? What are their challenges? How can you engage them? And if it's a very rich family market, can you build a family event? Can you bring that historic piece, that local community piece, into the, in, and do something specifically for that? <laughs> the community connection. Take that title and run with it, right? Um, if I was working with you or working for you, we'd be in there sorting that out in terms of putting something very simple in place, Barry. It doesn't need to be a headache for you. Um, because I know that you have a lot of volunteers and you give up your free time to, to run and support that. And yes, that's something that has come from a lot of the ports, Barry, actually, is how do we engage the community? You've got to go to them and you've got to think, OK, what is going to connect with them? What's going to make them think, cheapers, I'd love to hear more about that. Or I didn't know that. Or, you can, know. Can I just uh, come in there on that? And of course, John. Yeah. <clears throat> Barry, it, 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 like everyone knows this, and it's the same all over the world. Nobody, nobody goes out to be a tourist in their own town, and it's very hard to convince people who live nearby to come and visit you. And it's only when you get enough people from your locality to come and visit you that they start creating a little bit of buzz about you, and then everyone goes. Like, and Mags is exactly right. You, you can't just be the museum to your local community because they see it but they don't see it so you have to put on something it could be something simple like a coffee morning or um an event or a sing song or something anything that will pull in even if it's only 50 or 60 people um and then they'll start talking about you and, and it takes time i mean would you get a lot of visits from your local schools oh yeah we we, we do that uh, in fact the the curriculum in wales now has, has uh, changed substantially that they're now directed to uh, learn more about local history rather than 1066 and all that. Uh, yeah. So, um, for instance, uh, we, a few days ago we had uh, we had 130 children in, in, in different phases, obviously, uh, come to the school. They're interested yeah. in, in uh, specific things, particularly uh, the Second World War is something that they are interested in, we, which we do cover, but not uh, extensively. But the, mm. the rest of the maritime history of, of Hollyhead is, is, not, is not in their interest. They are specific tied to, to something which we can show them, yes. I, I, I do think that'll come now. Yeah. If you, you've got kids and, you know, of those 130, quite a few of them are going to be engaged by what you've, they've learned at the museum. And they're going to start hassling their parents to go back there the weekend. You know, it will have struck a chord with them. And then the parents will come back with them. And then they'd be like, oh, God, I knew this was here, but I never knew it was here. Yeah. I never knew it was this good. And then they'll so, be down the pole and they'll tell their friends and they'll, they'll turn up. It, it's one of these things that can happen very organically over the space of a year or two. But you can also, you can hurry that along by just throw a coffee morning or give people an incentive to come and, and, and use your building, but not, talk about it as the museum and they'll realize there's this museum and a wealth of fascinating things to find out about when they're there for what they thought was just something else you know that yeah. that often works yeah we, we see we see that um we do get parents coming back there you know the message is we've, we've been having school groups there since the inception of the museum uh, back in the 1980s uh, so you know we, we we recognize that as a, as a stream uh, mm. and that does work but it's, I, it's broadening it out a bit more. Yeah, it's uh, the fact that I've seen on the local social media, I've seen you've had the school children there and also you've lent the Margaret Hall Library some stuff as well. So that reminds people. Um, one suggestion um, is that maybe once a month or something like that, you focus on one of your bits of the exhibition so people actually see what's there. Um, I think, if I remember, I haven't been in your uh, bunk, um, war side yet for quite a while, but you had something on the Lusitania a few years ago. Maybe yeah. sort of have a feature um, 
post once a month say this is what we've got and so sort of fill out the backstory because that way it generates interest and it gets people visually behind the door um, and then gets sort of people oh didn't realize you had that and again it's if you got that one have a proper look and nosy and then um it's so the season what else you got there or one of the the big sewing machine uh by sent this is sent cereal uh stained glass windows so again it's sort of showing people what you've got you don't have to do the full museum but you could make a sort of post once a month showing people what you do have um because i wouldn't necessarily think maritime museum they've got a church is stained glass windows in there so again it's showing sort of cross selection of what you do have yeah we we, we do have a, a a blog an active blog which uh, yeah. you know tells various stories and ports past and present have, have picked up on that and uh, taken some of those stories forward and, and put it into their uh, output as well yeah. so, so we do nice yeah. yeah and it's worth doing it on your facebook as well facebook page as well hmm. um, yeah, we, just... we do keep you know we, we use social media as much as we possibly can yeah, I, I tried, I, I, you know that, that's one of my remits it's uh, within the, the trustee group is to, is to run the social media output and the website and things like that so we try and put something out or link to something uh, nearly two or three times a week at least so keep it active it, it, it it's a it's, it's something that you've got to feel, certainly got to be on top of and, and I, I certainly agree with you about that yeah, no, absolutely. Any other questions before we um, before we leave? Because I'm just conscious of time. Yes, Liz. Oh, I was just going to say something quick. Is that uh, you know when we when we do our tours and there's children there, we find we have to kind of change the message a bit or cater to them more because otherwise it's just sort of just a lecture you know and adults can deal with that or listening much longer than kids can but um one of the things about your site would be you know the children in maritime history you know what was their role the cabin boy the you know what were what did kids do because they did amazing things that we would not ever think of them doing now and connecting with them on that level, you know, uh, uh, and also just the the local community. How how was the local community involved in in you know the maritime? You know, finding little vignettes of people there and their history as uh, sailors or privateers or fishermen or whatever they were. You know, yeah, okay, I think yeah that's, that's really, good. really good suggestions there. I'm sorry, I'll have to leave now. I've got other That's things okay, to Barry, get on I'm with. And I found it very interesting. And, and thank you very much. It's given us quite, given me a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much. Goodbye. And I'll, I'll say goodbye. You're very welcome. And thank you, everybody. Wish you all a good week ahead. And thanks to our two speakers for taking the time to contribute. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hey, thank you. Bye bye. Slow.